you can't do a great building without really thinking about the interior, and you can't do a great interior without thinking about how it connects to a larger kind of idea. Why do people want to live or work in your spaces? I think there's a practical side to what we do, and then there's a more kind of exuberant side to what we do also. Yeah. We're not trying to be outrageous, we're just trying to uh, do good architecture. I grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is kind of an industrial mill town. My mother was very creative. She came to the U.S. from around the late 50s. My father was in construction. Do you remember, you used to go on the sites together? I did. He was a bricklayer, actually. And he used to, I was one of five boys. He could bring one of us with him. Did you enjoy it, or you enjoy being with your dad? You know, I hated it, but I enjoyed it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he was a craftsman, so I think I learned a lot through that process. Welcome. All right, I want to see. Yeah, we bought the building a year ago, and we're in the midst of renovating. Starting fresh. It looks like an art gallery. Everything is in process, and it's part of how we work. What is this project? This is actually a residential project, and we wanted to export the materiality of the building. This, this, is, this is a paper model. This is a 3D print. The drawing is kind of a amalgamation of, of all different ways in which we work and see, see the project. Did you know when you were in school that maybe you wanted to be an architect? When did the inspiration really strike? One day I picked up a, a Morphosis book and uh, I was just kind of amazed by what was inside there. It was kind of a whole new way of looking at architecture. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. While I was at UCLA, I worked for Frank Gehry. Uh, and then soon after that, I went to work for Tommy. Uh, Tom is very good about giving us a lot of responsibility as young designers. We did a design center in Taiwan, we did a stadium in Mexico. Creative office spaces were starting to happen at that time, so I did a lot of those. Did it give you a new appreciation for interiors as a holistic piece of the design equation? Yeah, because you know the interiors, the, the way we thought about them then, and the way I still continue to think about them is that it's it's, it's not just an interior, it's an environment. It's how one experiences a space, whether it's an office, a house, a restaurant. Interiors and architecture, they go hand in hand. Yeah. And then, then you opened your practice, right? I had an opportunity to do a residential project. My wife was expecting our first child, so I don't know what I was thinking, but I went off on my own and started my own architecture practice. It was a leap of faith, but yeah, I never looked back. We were trying to push certain ideas spatially, experientially, and that kind of started it. Patrick is an artist and a sculptor. Yes. And that is evident when you see our house. Harvey and Nina had lived in the home for how many years? 20 some years. 20 years, and they really wanted something different. We really were looking to have very clean lines, but activity in those lines. There's not a right angle pretty much in the whole house. At nighttime you get this light shining. It's a beautiful twinkle, right? Oh my god, it's so wonderful. It's like Christmas every day. Patrick, that's what I was saying. I'm like, is it? Am I in a different house? Here's the one that's twinkling at night. It's this house. Right, it is. So we're always trying new things, pushing new ideas, looking at new materials or new ways to fabricate. But you still have like this obsession. Is it an obsession with spray foam? We were on a tear there, just using the material. We started with the installation that we did downtown LA. That led to a few other projects. We did a project for Rick Owens, designer. The house was still working on it out in Joshua Tree, where we're using the foam as a fully integral building material. The profession is evolving, and uh, we as designers must evolve too. So what do we have here? Uh, these are various studies, prototypes. Beautiful. We're working on a series of stools for our residents, <coughs> and we have, we have these ideas of um, molding. Custom butt stools. <laughs> yeah, so. It's so beautiful. Whose butt is that? I can't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> it's easy to design a project and then not have it built. So you, you have to be pretty smart about figuring out a way to get to built. And, and oftentimes that comes with um, 
uh, being very practical. Yeah, but you're not going for the obvious. Let's put it, let's put it out there. Patrick. We, you know, we, we strive for um, great design. But sometimes that means a, a project needs to be really simple. And maybe there's an opportunity to push a, a piece or an area or an idea. In my own studio, I try to create an atmosphere where people want to be engaged and want to collaborate. So we work in the commercial realm, development, mixed-use projects. Housing is a huge issue in LA, so right now we have several affordable housing projects also in the works. Good design doesn't discriminate. So Patrick, this is a very special building. The residents here are formerly homeless LGBTQ youth uh, and other people with disabilities. We play with this idea of having this connection to the city, but yet being it being protected and safe. It's so cool in here. The plant thing helps. Uh, we create almost like a microclimate. We implemented the first gray water system in the city for this project. Hey, I'm Angela. Angela, good to see yeah, you. Yeah, nice to meet you. What's it like to live here? I call it my sanctuary. Yeah. No, I call it our little sanctuary. I had years of struggle, but now I'm here. Absolutely, completely, overwhelmingly changed my life. Thank you. That's so nice. I love this place. <laughs> You know, people think that affordable housing is this horrible thing and no one really wants it in their backyard. But, you know, these are just people wanting a place to live. And architecturally, they can be something special. We've been able to kind of elevate uh, what those projects can be. We're finishing up a park in Santa Monica. We have these enormous shade structures. The park is a universally accessible playground, so it's designed for children of all abilities. We like it when the architecture works at different levels, so it can work for kids with disabilities, but it also can be, you know, architecture with a capital A. We're very much interested in building, but also we're interested in this other angle of the work, which is representation. Right now we have a show at downtown LA at the A&D Museum. You can work at a certain level and explore certain things at the scale of a building. And then you can also explore those same ideas or different ones at the scale of a drawing or at the scale of an artifact. We call it doppelgangers because it's like more than one way of looking at a project. Your work is like pieces of art. I think part about architecture these days is What's different from us is we, we produce a lot of shit. We make stuff, we make <laughs> models and drawings. We're always moving in different directions. Everybody is, right? So we try to harness that and push design. That's, that's what we do. sat at our conference room table in the office and when Cindy started the interview, apparently I started tapping my hand on the table. <laughs> the crew had to stop the filming because of this distracting thumping and they said, 
Patrick, will you please stop tapping your hand on the table? <laughs> so we started, we started back up again the second time. <laughs> Only to be interrupted again. Patrick, will you please stop hitting your hands on the table? So we proceeded with the interview. <laughs> And then finally, Sam, the director of photography, burst out with, hey, dude, stop slamming your goddamn hand on the table. <laughs> <clears throat> At that point, we all broke out into laughter, and, and that kind of broke the ice. Uh, after that, the rest of the day really was a breeze. Uh, and by the second day, we're having a blast, and at times laughing so hard that it hurt. The fact is that Cindy has this way about her. Uh, she makes one feel at ease, and she brings out the best in people. And I felt that firsthand. I'm very grateful that uh, she and her colleagues at Interior Design have been so supportive and encouraging of me since I started my practice. Uh, Edie Cohen, too, in LA, has always been a real champion. Uh, sometimes. Woo! A real champion, sometimes a, a, a fierce critic, uh, but always a, a true friend. Thank you, Edie. And in, and in New York, uh, Helene, Carol, and everyone at the magazine has always been so helpful. So thank you, Interior Design. I would be remiss not to mention the people that we collaborate with on these jobs. Uh, the work really is a, a team effort. We're always looking for new collaborations with great people, and I only have gratitude for our clients and partners, some of whom are, are here in this room. Uh, and special thanks to my office. Without their dedication, hard work, none of this would really be possible. Several are here tonight. Thank you to Felipe, Albert, Andrena, Kervin Lau, and Antonio Foldo. Hey. And to Art Gray, the wonderful photographer who has shot many of our projects over the years. Thank you, Art. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I'd like to acknowledge my family. My all my brothers are here, as you can hear them. Uh, <laughs> uh, these guys have always kept me in check from day one. Uh, we've been through a lot. <clears throat> Growing up, we went through some rough times. <clears throat> and through it all, we've always had each other's back. So for that, I'm very thankful. Woo! Thanks to my kids, Niall and Anya, they keep me grounded constantly. They're constantly telling me how uncool I am. <laughs> I love you anyway. <laughs> and finally, thanks to Tish, my partner, who's always been there, who's provided confidence, encouragement, and support, even at times when it was very difficult. Hey. So tonight, we celebrate design. We're living in strange, dark, and as we're constantly here in unprecedented times, where each day brings a new scandal or a new tragedy that eclipses the one from the day before. Well, at least we have design, right? Yeah. Woo! The power of design lifts our spirits. It provides optimism when we need it. It enhances our experiences. And when it's done right, it can improve lives. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. As designers, we, we can create the necessary light. We sculpt shadow, and we're able to contrast, minimize, replace, and even obliterate darkness. Thank you for this great honor. Congratulations to Kengo, Lisa, Craig, and Marcel. I'm so thrilled to be in their company along with the past honorees. Tonight I'm humbled, I'm motivated, and most of all, I'm empowered. Empowered to go out, to continue to do good work, to use the tools that I have as a designer to make a difference, to relieve some of that darkness, and to shine more of the much needed light that we need out into this world. So thank you. Woo!
video. Oh yes, Patrick, yes, Patrick. <laughs> and he doesn't disappoint with the gold lame suit, right? <laughs> Although I am sure he is never gonna hear the end of it from his cool brothers. <laughs> what the hell is he wearing, right guys? Yeah, no, he looks amazing, trust me. <laughs> trust me, he looks amazing. Thank you, Patrick.